uh, topic out there, I uh, wanted to really talk about the chaos that's in product development and working together with our teams. But in light of COVID-19, I also want to spend time addressing the chaos that is in our current lives right now. And so some of these things apply whether or not we're in quarantine, but some of them are specific to it um, in particular. Uh, of that. So if you haven't met me before, my name is Sarah Reed. Um, I'm principal of research and design at, at Dialexa. And um, one of the things going on right now that I'm obsessed with after watching The Tiger King was uh, watching Money Heist. So that's my new Netflix obsession. Um, and they have a thing where they pick the different cities as names. And so I went through the exercise of if I had to pick a name of a city to be my name, I decided it would be Athens. And that's because I love the uh, Greco-Roman period in art. And I love the humanism and celebrating what it is to be human. So that's a little fun fact about me. Um, as mentioned, I work on a lot of cool products at Dialexa, and some of the ones I've most recently worked on were uh, kiosks, and for this particularly, it was interesting to me not only to do different screen sizes that I'm used to um, dealing with, but also uh, working with the teams on the hardware integration and making seamless uh, interactions for people to, to get what they need through the their process that's been uh, fun for me to, to work with. So when looking at this topic, I did some research to really try to understand chaos and its role in our lives and its role in our, our, product, our, our product world. And so um, with that research, the conclusion I came to you about what is a pattern within our chaos is that it's actually you who's the problem with all this chaos. You're the ones causing us uh, heartburn and issue because there, you may have thought you communicated a certain way, but it didn't come out that way, or you may have felt something and we were able to pick up on it. And so we just aren't as rational as we think we are. And we end up being some of the uh, starters of the chaos in our own uh, communities and world. And so as we go through this talk today, what I really want to look at is uh, examining the chaos. What is it? Uh, how, what do we understand about it? And recognizing the chaos that we're currently in, meaning that chaos is in a little bit of everything because that's the human nature of um, being human. And when we recognize the current chaos that we're in, we're able to uh, understand it, observe it, be uh, able to recover um, from it, and then we're able to take care of ourselves and reach out and take care of others. When, it ta when we talk about product design and we talk about connecting um, with others, it's really about being able to listen to our customers and find their needs. And in or order to listen to their needs, we first have to take care of ourselves in order to be able to reach and, and help each other out. So those are the things that we're going to be talking about through this uh, talk. So the definition of chaos is that there's complete disorder and confusion. That's the pure and simple um, information about chaos. But I found this interesting when I went to Wikipedia to understand chaos. Um, I found it interesting that from so art and science, we have this uh, history and this lexicon of chaos in our, in our world. And it was very interesting to see how science has chaos theory, which is a nonlinear process, and that um, chaos comes out of mythology, and it comes out of a place where uh, there's chaos, and that's in the beginning, and then out from chaos becomes the, comes the first beings that are able to create this world that we know and, and exist. And so I find something very poetic and interesting in this idea of chaos and our relationship to it in our history about how beautiful things come out of chaos and uh, foundational things come out of chaos, come out of this disorder and this uh, uniqueness. 
Um, but a more modern take on chaos here is uh, I want to focus on is reality TV, partially because I find it fascinating, um, especially at shows like The Bachelor, because it's the um, same setup, right? We know from the beginning of the show that they're going to end, there's going to be one person that he picks that he ends up with. We know that it's pretty formulaic um, in the way that we're going to find the same villain. There's going to be these archetypes in here and it's been the same way for several years now, but we still sign up to watch. It's still one of uh, the most popular uh, network shows. And the, I think the reason for that is because of the chaos in between. We like um, seeing that chaos and understanding what's what's going on there and uh, watching the Tiger King I threw on this this fun infographic on here because that's just pure and utter chaos that we can't help but but watch and relate to and there's something about uh, others people's chaos that gives us comfort um, in potentially our own chaos and the authentic authenticness of the, the human condition. So now that we've taken a little bit about exploring chaos, uh, its history, its relevance to pop culture, I want to spend some time really recognizing the chaos that we're, we are currently in and um, being able to relate to that. So to kick off this session, I wanted to go into another breakout room to just specifically talk about what is contributing to our chaos right here, right now um, in our lives. We are back. Perfect, good, good, good. Well, hopefully you guys got at least some catharsis out being able to talk about what contributes to your chaos and um, what goes on there. For me personally, what contributes to my chaos are my feelings. Whether we're in COVID-19 or not, this is very true for me. And I find even, um, not only do my feelings contribute to my chaos because I believe that I um, am very logical. And oftentimes I find that sitting down and doing work is not the issue. I very rarely have problems with the work. It's the dealing with my feelings and being able to work with people together that often contribute to this chaos that um, ensues within my life and my feelings of getting, um, not being productive. And I also find this interesting because some of the most um, troublesome client interactions we've had or projects I've had in the past often come down to the um, feelings that the clients have and how uh, the team is interacting together and their boundaries and difficult clients oftentimes it's not about the necessarily the work but it's about the feelings that ensue and uh, how those things relate to each other and so I have, in order to be able to um, deal with the chaos and being able to manage my feelings and how they work with each other, um, I am fortunate to be married to a licensed professional counselor and he's taught me a lot about cognitive behavioral therapy. And what I have on here are some apps who use CBT therapy. Mood notes would be my uh, recommendation for really seeing the whole um, process of that uh, therapy, but that has really helped me be able to not just deal with the surface things that happen with, with my feelings, but actually be able to feel and process and actually understand the deeper feelings that I'm trying to avoid. And by being able to connect to those things, I am able to then uh, figure out a strategy and a solution to not only let those feelings go, but also address them in a way that I want to address them on my terms in a way that is productive with working with uh, teams and, and people around me. And so the idea here that I really like from headspace metaphor is that we always have a blue sky um, and uh, feelings and, and things happen, especially in COVID-19, I think we can relate to this, uh, where sometimes we forget that there's blue sky still there um, and Practices like meditation and journaling help me to be able to ground myself. And so the metaphor is um, it's still raining outside and there's still a lot going on, but I'm in the house uh, being able to watch the rainstorm rather being in the rain and, and reacting to it. And so I find 
that being able to understand feelings and connect with them is an important aspect of being able to ground and, and center yourself and be able to uh, work with others. Particularly right now, um, for me, it's really important to have a self-care routine in order to make sure that I am well balanced and taken care of so that I can uh, interact with my teammates. Uh, the first week in probably shelter in place, I thought, this is great. It's like a vacation. This is awesome. The second week, I kind of was like, eh, I'm not so sure about this. There's some downers. And I've definitely hit the, the quarantine wall. And I find if I skirt off these other things in favor of just barreling in and being focused on work, that I burn out really quickly and um, lose a lot of my motivation to, to be the best self that I wanna be for my team. And so finding ways for me to move, meditate and pamper myself has been really critical for me in this time to be able to uh, manage some of the, the chaos that we have to deal with every day and that we don't always expect <laughs> coming at us. Um, particularly, I just wanted to highlight these particular books that I've read in the past. I think they're very helpful in ways to be able to be proactive about managing your day, about being able to um, make sure that you're taking breaks throughout your uh, work so that you can sustain high performance and find uh, places in nature and uh, moments for nature so that you feel more at calm, more relaxed and potentially more, more creative. But once we are able to take care of ourselves and be able to center ourselves in our own chaos and be able to manage that within, um, we then can start reaching out and taking care of our team. Um, this is especially important right now because we are social beings and uh, introvert or extrovert, regardless, we still crave uh, closeness and companionship with other people. And so I found it very helpful to find moments to turn my camera on and still reach out with my team and with my friends uh, over this time. Um, so that's been uh, really important to acknowledge and find times that I can connect with uh, the people that I have in my life so that uh, I can still feel that connection. Um, resources that I would recommend on your own time to be able to be inspired about this idea of closeness is uh, with Brene Brown. She talks a lot about the power of vulnerability and being authentic. So by being able to acknowledge your vulnerableness and admit that with a group helps bring closeness. And Kelly McGonigal talks about how stress, a lot of times we try to manage it, combat it and run away from it. But she has a new perspective on it and how we can lean in and, and, and use stress as a tool to actually uh, embrace it. And that with relationships and friends that actually can open up new doors and new connections with uh, each other when we embrace stress and admit it to each other and lean on each other for support. And then Simon Sinek talks about how um, being a good leader in this time isn't necessarily a matter of your rank or where you sit on the totem pole, but that it's being able to take care of the person to the right and the left of you. And by being able to take care of others and sacrifice your needs for your team's needs, that that inspires in turn for them to do the same for you. And that um, it, it creates a sense of bonding between uh, teammates in a way that we actually enjoy working together and want to work in that way. So those are some very inspirational people about taking care of your team. Some practical tips um, that are from my team and what we're doing right now. Um, in this time, we have added stand downs. So not only do we have stand ups in the morning, but we actually have stand down time to uh, check in on work and check in on each other. Um, we've also made short term goals important for each week. And we've outlined at least this week and next week so that we're all aligned on what those short term goals are. And that's helped us be able to stay focused on raising the flag if we need help and help each other out. And it also helps us feel productive and feel like we're making progress and have something attainable that we can, we can um, hang our hat on. 
specifically in my one-on-ones, it's been important to ask things outside of work and make sure that there's just mental checks going on about uh, any things that don't have to do with our project. And one thing I've really appreciated about our teams too is that we've made sure that basic needs are met. There was one Friday we had where we ended up having a fire that we had to put out and then a client demo that went long. And then by the time we got to our retro at two o'clock, we realized none of us had eaten. And so instead of going with basic retro ceremonies, we made sure that everybody could pause, we could eat lunch together, we could catch up and we ended up playing Jackbox games and just you know blowing off some steam. And so these are all different ways that we've really made sure that the team is taken care of and the team has uh, uh, works as a unit to be able to, to work together during this time. And then um, beyond taking care of yourself and then being able to take care of your team, your community, your family right next to you, um, looking at the bigger picture of your community, taking care of your company, um, to be able to take care of your company, a lot of times we think um, when we first start out that our comp the company we work for is this other kind of entity um, that uh, is somebody that we, we are hired by and we work for. But then as we grow in our career, we realize that uh, the company and the culture is defined by us and how we act and how we relate to each other. And so if we want to change the company culture, we start by changing the way we act uh, towards each other. And um, I find that very empowering and very helpful as a reminder um, in these times that um, I'm empowered to be able to, if I see a need or see a gap, I can reach out and make a difference in my, in my company. And I've really appreciated in our leadership right now and our senior leadership, they've been very transparent about the things that are on top of mind for them, the challenges they're facing and the strategies they have and that transparency has helped others be able to lean in and figure out how they can align what they're doing to meet these goals. And especially right now, it's a, a good thing to recognize that we are all in survival mode, um, trying to survive this the particular area, take care of ourselves, take care of our company. And then from that, we will come to a stage of recovery where we're able to um, be able to get our footing again and then from there we will evolve. Uh, COVID-19 is changing the world and changing the way we work and we will have new opportunities and new um, things that we can take advantage of and so we will be looking at for things that can evolve and so by taking care of ourselves we're able to ground and, and root ourselves and by then, uh, coming from that strong foundation, we're able to reach out to our uh, near communities. And from there, we can begin to recover and springboard and find new ways of coming together and building together in this new normal. So now we're gonna take a little bit about connecting with the chaos in our product work, because now that we've talked about specifically us and how we can better ourselves to help everyone else out. We now can talk about how are we gonna look out and reach out to our customers and actually hear what they're saying and listen to their needs and be able to respond in, in a different way. Um, I find product management is really about thriving in chaos. When you are in product, <laughs> there's a lot of things that uh, lends itself to being chaotic, especially since the process is nonlinear. In fact, I think my next slide is all about the different graphs, right? I've seen so many circle graphs about how our process is a loop. Um, it's anything but linear. We've really gone away from waterfall. Um, there is no one source of uh, truth when it comes to product management and making decisions. You're getting um, information from customers, you're getting information from stakeholders, you're getting information from your team, and you not one of those can be the guiding North Star. You have to synthesize and really make understandings and visions and put that all together. And you really can't do this alone with one team. You're working with several different teams and they may have a different perspective or a different viewpoint on things. And you've got to be able to manage and create alignment between a lot of different competing entities. And I really like this, uh, little uh, 
thing on the bottom here on the slide about uh, how product management comes, comes about or how these insights come about where you start out understanding customers' needs and then you end up realizing that there's tea and is tea the only thing we can offer them and is that okay? And there's so many things to unravel about how we got to that situation and how can we make it better. And so we're all looking for better ways of working and better ways to, to be able to deliver great products to our teams and to our customers. And so, um, yeah, as I mentioned, there's several different ways that we have been evolving and we have been experimenting with what's the best way to work together as a team to deliver something and feel good about the work that, that we're delivering. Well, I found that design thinking has been very popular and helpful in product management and as a process and a tool for teams to come together. I'd even uh, say that I believe that agile isn't working the way we were hoping it's working and there are methods out there or companies out there that are tired of trying to implement agile in some theoretical way and calling it fragile. And so design thinking is very alluring because um, it really does bring teams together and brings creativity and empowers the teams to, to solve solutions. And I think some of the key aspects of design thinking that is, is great for right now is that uh, everyone can be a part of learning something. We can start at ground zero and actually learn from our customers and our users um, what their pain points are and we can really um, be on the same page of information and have new fresh current information. And with that, we can ideate together and good ideas can come from anywhere. They're not just from one person who has the title of good idea maker, that teams can come together and be able to be part of the process of creating something new and, and innovative. And then finally, we can actually learn from what we're doing. So it's not just opinions fighting each other out and the loudest opinion wins. It's a process that um, looks at how do people react and can we validate this hypothesis? And it's no longer about who has the right uh, rank or the right uh, way of presenting their ideas. It's about how is this idea and coming to life in, in users' hands. And so that's where I find uh, design thinking super critical to uh, how people are working and how they're wanting to work and work together. I also think uh, design thinking specifically right now, when we're talking about this idea of chaos, design thinking and design in general lends itself to being comfortable in chaos. There's something that um, I learned from when I went through art school about being very comfortable with this idea that I could start with a blank canvas and I could choose a paint medium that was very forgiving for iterations. And I am comfortable with, I'm gonna attack this canvas with this idea, but at the end of it, it will respond to me and I'll respond to it. And at the end, I'll have this thing that I didn't anticipate um, making in the first place, that uh, it'll be different than what I expected. And I think designers and creatives are comfortable with tackling a problem without knowing the end solution and being able to go through that process and know that there's going to be guiding lights and trusting it in order to be able to create something that they couldn't even um, anticipate themselves creating together. Um, so we talk a lot, I've heard a lot about like design thinking being customer centric and that being a, a positive aspect to it. I think one thing that's not always called out in um, design thinking process is not only is it about putting our, our focus on the user, but it's also allowing diverse teams to come together and get different perspectives than is usually uh, um, would normally happen. And so I think this diversity of groups is really important for innovation and important for coming up with new ideas. And there's some sources out there that help uh, point me in that direction and help me uh, solidify this, this viewpoint because I found it very interesting on uh, NPR's Hidden Brain, they had a whole um, section about uh, how diversity has improved different groups and improved um, different businesses throughout the, the years. And 
the one that they really hit on home for me was that the scientific paper community, the scientific community, when they produce um, different results and different papers, the ones that got most prestige were the ones that uh, had collaboration between different ethnicities and different groups, that the ones that uh, stayed within similar groups came up with similar ideas that um, just wasn't as uh, innovative and wasn't as recognized by, by the community as when they reached out from each other and worked together um, from different perspectives. I also took a master class with Malcolm Gladwell, especially now that we have some more downtime, I'd recommend it. Um, but David and Goliath, uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about doing research for that particular book. And he talks about how he first uh, went to a lot of theology to do his research and he found that it was a similar story told throughout the ages in the same way. And it wasn't until he went to the medical community and looked at uh, the story of David and Goliath through their lens that he saw that um, there was this um, basically disease that Goliath had to where he's actually blind and uh, couldn't see some of the things that with David was hurling out of him because of his own disease. And so uh, Gladwell gets really excited and um, encouraging about this idea because by looking at it through a different lens, that story becomes so much more poetic and so much more interesting because then Goliath can become this metaphor of this uh, big strong being um, can't help but have these disabilities and these things that he's blind to and weak to. And so it's a great analogy for things like large corporations who have seem to have all the resources and all the wealth, but because of that, um, they have a lot of weaknesses where the little guy can come in and, and take them down pretty straightforward. And so um, he talks a lot about this idea of when you're looking for interesting stories and interesting ideas that grab uh, attention, look at um, worlds that are opposed to each other and are not necessarily in the same realm. And you'll find some more interesting and innovative ideas and inspiration rather than um, going to the predictable uh, space that you, you could go. So what I really want to hit home here with, with this talk is in order for us to really be able to take care of our clients and listen to their needs, we have to have an aspect of understanding uh, ourselves and being able to understand the chaos and the human element that's within us. And by being able to understand that and be able to manage it, we can then start listening to people and addressing their needs. Because in product management, it's really important in designing for, for our customers. It's, un, it's important for us to be able to listen and be able to understand them. And in order to do that, we really need to ground ourselves before um, being able to fully engage with others. It's similar to the idea and that metaphor that in order to take care of other people, we have to put our oxygen mask on first before we put it on the person next to us. And so as we go out throughout um, this time, I will encourage you guys to really figure out a way in which you can take care of yourselves in order to start listening and working with your teams to be able to deliver better products to your, to your clients and to your customers. Um, so now I'd like to take a breakout room now that we've talked a little bit about these different concepts of, of managing chaos. I'd like uh, to spend some time to, for us to talk about how we can better manage chaos in our own lives. Um, and I think Cassini, if we could maybe do 10 minutes for that, that would be great. Well, thank you guys. I, I appreciate you taking the time and hopefully out of this, you feel a little bit inspired and a little bit empowered to be able to manage the chaos that's in your life now and come out on, on the other side of it. I want to leave you guys with something a little um, inspirational here at the end of, of the night as we conclude um, our evening. And um, I picked out this poem that I found very inspirational. In fact, I, I read it like senior year in, in high school. And what I love about this poem is I feel like it connects with the sense of knowing that things may not go the way we want them to go and, and that there's a little um, uncertainty and, and nervousness on um, what the future holds, but knowing that 
embracing life and going out into it is uh, enriching and important and it's part of what makes makes life so beautiful. So this is a poem by Edgar Lee Masters. He's an American poet. This is George Gray. I have studied many times the marble which was chiseled for me, a boat with a furled say, sail at rest in a harbor. In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered to me and I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow knocked at my door, but I was afraid. Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. To put meaning in one's life may end in madness, but life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It's a boat longing for the sea and yet afraid. So thank you guys. And now we can go to the Q and A.